as a direct result of her failures, uh, Ms. Gutierrez's call caused Ms. Hutchins' death. Rest production in the state want to scapegoat her. What's your job there with him? I'm the armor. Or at least I was. The actor, Alec Baldwin, pointed a gun on that set. He pulled the trigger. It's supposed to be a cold gun. So who is more to blame, the armorer or the actor in the Baldwin movie set shooting? And in the Idaho student murders case, Brian Koberger wants his trial moved out of Moscow. Plus, Lori Vallow-Daybell is facing murder charges in Arizona, and Dr. Kenny Kinsey analyzes the crime scene for us. It's all coming up next for you, plus much more right here on Opening Statements. Good Friday morning to you. Welcome to Opening Statements. I'm your host, Julie Grant, and it's great to have you along with us. If you're new to the show, well, welcome. We're so glad you're here. I say the show is kind of like coffee and court because we get you all warmed up in the morning covering the major cases that are making headlines both in the world of trial and in the world of true crime. Right now, it's time for you to grab a cup of coffee because it's time for my opening statement. It's official. Coward Montgomery is a convicted killer. And not just any killer, his daughter's killer. It is confirmed that he is the sinister, soulless, gutless, rotten, manipulative dirtbag that I always thought he was. Now, if only there was a punishment to fit his crimes. Personally, I don't think imprisonment is enough for him. His case makes me wish we had eye for an eye punishment in America. He beat his beautiful daughter Harmony to death. He should have to feel the same pain she felt. That sweet, innocent, helpless, precious little angel. She had to have been scared to death. Imagine what her last moments on this earth were like. She had to have been terrified. I sure hope that Coward Montgomery feels the same way in prison. If he's not sleeping with one eye open, he should be. Because there are people in prison who would never do what he did. These people have a moral compass and they don't take kindly to people who harm children. So Coward Montgomery just may get some eye for an eye punishment in the pen. And probably the only person who will care is Kayla. Kayla better wise up and get herself some help and realize that she's getting a second chance in life. Because with him being locked up, she's no longer at risk of him killing her. Believe me, a guy like him wouldn't hesitate to make her next. Wise up, Kayla. Straighten out and thank your lucky stars that you lived. Sadly, beautiful Harmony did not. But her legacy will live on. I believe that her face has become synonymous with child abuse prevention. So let's keep our eyes and our hearts open to the people around us, especially the kids, and speak up if we suspect child abuse is happening. So much great work can be done in Harmony's memory. Remember, we don't have to be police to fight crime. Rest in peace, sweet angel Harmony. Justice was served. That's my opening statement on this Friday morning. Let me know if you like it. Right now, I want to give you what's on your daily docket. I do want to leave you with one final statement. And this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. She says at the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. All right, here's a look at the cases we're following for you today on Court TV. In New Mexico, testimony resumes at 10.30 a.m. in the trial of the Rust movie Armorer. In Georgia, court kicks off at 9.30 a.m. against accused cult leader Elysio Bishop. 
And in Connecticut, Michelle Traconis' defense is set to start calling their final witness at 10 a.m. This is in the trial over the death and disappearance of mother of five, Jennifer Dulos. Right now, let's turn back to New Hampshire, where on Thursday, as I mentioned, the jury reached its verdict in the case of the murder of Harmony Montgomery. As to charge ID 202, 7112C, charging the defendant, Adam Montgomery, with the crime of second-degree murder. Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. You say that he's guilty, Mr. Foreperson? That is correct. So say you all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Yes. For more on the reaction to that verdict, let's take you to Manchester, New Hampshire now, where we find Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson with the latest. Julie, good morning. Convicted killer Adam Montgomery was not here for his trial or the reading of the verdict, but he will have to be in court for sentencing. Career criminal Adam Montgomery, now a convicted killer. The jury of two men and ten women finding him guilty on all counts, including assault and second-degree murder of his five-year-old daughter, Harmony. Charging the defendant, Adam Montgomery, with the crime of second-degree murder. Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. The jury deliberating for six hours 44 minutes over two days. The high profile trial lasting 11 days with 47 witnesses, which included Harmony's mother, Crystal Sori, former friends of Adam, three inmates, including his estranged wife, and a witness who dodged her subpoena and had to be arrested to testify. At the reading of the verdict, the courtroom in New Hampshire was packed, and Harmony's mother broke down in tears in the gallery. He's a coward. He's always been a coward. That's why he did what he did. He took her away from the people that loved her because he couldn't hack that he didn't have control. That's all he cared about was control of everything in his life. She wasn't anything to him. And Montgomery is facing up to life in prison. His sentencing date has not yet been set, but he will have to be here for those victim impact statements. And Crystal Sori says that she will be here. That's the very latest from New Hampshire. I'll send it back to you, Julie. All right, thanks to Matt Johnson for that update. Now, while nothing can bring beautiful harmony back, the verdict could help give some closure to the people who love and miss her the most. Unfortunately, there's still one outstanding question. Where are Harmony's remains? They've never been found. But according to the assistant district attorney, Ben Agati, they're determined to find her and give her the proper burial. It's important that we find her for dignity, for respect for another human being. It's, it's not about a feather in the cap. And uh, none of these people here, none of all those agencies that I listed, it's not about a feather in the cap to say that we found her. It's about this is what she deserves. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Everybody has that level of dignity that they should be afforded. And Harmony is just like anybody else. She deserves to have that too. And so the search is going to continue for her until we're able to find her. And this prosecutor did a fine job getting justice for Harmony. Let's talk a little bit more about the trial, about the defendant, about what's ahead. Will the judge compel him to be there at sentencing? I have two great guests standing by with us this morning, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Joe Tamburino and criminal defense attorney David Bruno. Great to have you both on the program today. Joe, let me start with you. I want to get all your thoughts on everything, the advocacy, the fact that he never showed up, uh, and whether the judge might compel him at sentencing. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Well, I mean, the advocacy was good on both sides, and I got a feel for the public defenders. They had a horrible client to deal with, not only factually, but also professionally, because he never showed up. He didn't want to go in. Now, I know he used the excuse that they do some type of body search on him, but still, he should have shown up. I wasn't surprised with the verdict, and really, the only thing he could do is to try to parlay his knowledge of where Harmony could possibly be in order to try to lighten his sentence. But even with that, I don't know how much that's going to help him because, as we know, he's already serving, what, up to 30 years on his gun charges? So he's really in a corner. And I hope the judge does force him to come to court. Mm -hmm. I mean, physically force him. If they have to shackle him to the chair, bring him in. 
Yes, Joe, I love it. I love it. I know so many people watching are thinking exactly what you just said. Thank you for that. I've got another clip from Benjamin Agati. Uh, he is the senior assistant attorney general uh, on the case. He delivered the closing arguments. Let's take a look at some of what he said to the media after the verdict. Why did this trial in particular touch your heart so much because you were so passionate um i, I think I, I don't know if i would say touch my heart so much i think i one of the reasons is that i think it's if you're not concerned by this behavior by this action by this reaction from a person to a child having accidents and then doing this incredible thing um there's a problem you you need to understand the gravity, not only what the person did, but also for not showing the the compassion that you would hope any parent would show. And that's certainly not what he showed towards Harmony. So yeah, with regards to that, in terms of heartfelt experience and throwing, showing emotion, um, I, I think it's hard not to be for anybody. Child death cases are something else. David Bruno, let me go to you next, please. Uh, share with us your thoughts on all of it, the advocacy, the job done by both sides, uh, what you think may be coming next for Mr. Montgomery. Yeah, first of all, I agree with your opening statement and I agree with Joe as well. I mean, the fact is I, I thought this verdict would come in much quicker. I was actually surprised uh, and kudos to the jury. Not only did the prosecutor do their job, but also think about these jurors. These jurors had to sit through this testimony, this really graphic testimony about abuse. And it's cases like this that bring this issue and awareness up to the forefront. Because I think that the system also could be improved on how we protect our children. Uh, don't forget there was a custody dispute and the, the child was in his custody. And uh, th I think that there could have been some things done differently. Hindsight's 2020, but the fact is he was a coward. He didn't even come to court to face these charges. And I'm surprised that the, the guilty verdict didn't come quicker. Right, David, thank you for that. I know you are echoing, echoing the sentiment of so many of our viewers. I mean, we were all looking at our watches, watching the clock, tweeting, saying, what in the world is happening? What are they doing in there? And uh, certainly we applaud them for being so thoughtful and careful. And obviously they went through the evidence meticulously as they should. But I think there was that sense of, oh my, oh my, is this going to go the other direction because of the time? Uh, let me end the segment here with a clip from Crystal Sori. So she is Harmony's biological mother. Uh, and, and full disclosure here, she didn't have Harmony for much time before Harmony was taken away from her, uh, put in the custody of the state, lived in foster care uh, for most of her life uh, before the, the end of her life when she went with uh, her biological father. Uh, but Crystal Sori has a message to Adam Montgomery. Let's take a look. Do you have a message for Adam today if he's listening to any of this or heard the verdict? What would you say to him today? That I hope that what he did plays over in his mind every single waking moment that he lives on this earth. And I hope that he never falls asleep without seeing her beautiful face. Adam Montgomery, uh, things are not over for him yet. Uh, David Bruno, Joe Tamburino, I'm so glad you both are on the show. We've got to hit a break. I've got more questions coming your way in a moment. Before we do that, though, we want to let you know about another big verdict that came in on Thursday. This is in that Alaska case we were telling you about. That defendant right there, yeah, the jury found Brian Stephen Smith guilty of 14 counts relating to the murders of two women. We, the jury, find the defendant Brian Stephen Smith guilty of murder in the first degree is charged in count one. We, the jury, find the defendant Brian Stephen Smith guilty of murder in the second degree is we, the jury, find the defendant Brian Stephen Smith guilty of sexual assault in the second degree is we, the jury, find the defendant Brian Stephen Smith guilty of tampering with physical evidence. This guy's a dangerous guy. Thank goodness he is off the streets. No word yet on the date for his sentencing, but we'll keep you posted when we learn that. Now, the crimes were discovered after a third woman stole his cell phone and turned that evidence over to police. You know, she is very fortunate uh, that she wasn't next. And, and what a way police discovered all this from going through that phone. He had videotaped one of the homicides. Really sick stuff. And thank goodness he's not going to see the light of day. We're going to hit a break, friends. When we come back, here's what we have coming up next for you this Friday morning on Opening Statements.
We don't have, obviously, cases like this on a normal basis. We're not the big city stuff. And sure. So this is definitely different for all of us, and it hit really close to home, and it's pretty horrific, actually. Brian Koberger wants a change of venue for his trial. But should it be moved? We'll talk about it. And Lori Valadebel facing murder charges in Arizona. We're breaking down the evidence at the crime scene with forensic expert and beloved expert witness, Dr. Kenny Kinsey. Join Court TV's Vinnie Politan. In every story, in every trial, every case, there's at least two sides to it. To dive into the latest. Oh my God. And breaking true crime stories. This was a very targeted, very personal attack. Inside. My whole life depends on it. And outside of the courtroom. She's a psychopath. Now, let's look at the other side of all of that. Vinnie Politan Investigates premieres March 2nd, only on Court TV. There. Now for what's trending in true crime. The lawyers for Idaho murder suspect Brian Koberger are seeking a change of venue, citing inflammatory publicity. Koberger's defense team doesn't believe that he can receive a fair trial in the community where the murders happened. And they're asking the judge to relocate the case. Koberger's attorneys filing the motion last month saying in part, quote, a fair and impartial jury cannot be found in Latok County. Uh, due to the extensive inflammatory pretrial publicity allegations made about Mr. Koberger to the public by media that will be inadmissible at his trial, the small size of the community, the salacious nature of the alleged crimes and severity of the charges Mr. Koberger uh, faces. Okay. Um, you would have to be living on another planet, right, to have never heard anything about this case. So our question for our legal eagles this morning is, must this trial be moved in order to seat a fair jury? Let's bring them all in now. Still with me, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor David Bruno, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Joe Tamburino, and criminal defense attorney and brand new guest to opening statements, Michael Riley. Uh, Michael, great to have you. I assure you, you are in excellent company alongside Joe and David. Uh, welcome to the program and so uh, let's talk a little bit about this uh, we know uh, you have to be living under a rock to have never heard about this case seen something read something maybe watch some court TV about it but sh should this you know the the judge grant this request so as to move venue outside of Latah County will that help anything we know never hearing about the cases and the standard, right? So what do we think? Does the defense have a good argument here? David Bruno, would you start things off for us, please? Oh, I'd love to. I want to point the audience to the Boston bombing case. All right, that is a case where there's a lockdown. There, there are people in their homes because of the disastrous trauma, right? In that case, same motion was not moved out of that venue. Now again, different circumstances. This is over here in Moscow, but guess what? It's up to the discretion of the judge. And just because people have heard of the case doesn't mean they can't be fair and impartial. And that will be the ultimate question during voir dire when the attorneys have the opportunity to question the, witness, the, the jurors, the prospective jurors, can they be fair and impartial? And just look at Boston bombing. It didn't happen there. I don't think it should happen here. David Bruno, that's a great example. Thank you for that. Joe Tamburino, let me go to you next, please, my friend. Uh, your thoughts on this? No, it's not going to be moved. And I'll one up the Boston bombing. Here we had in Minneapolis the George Floyd murder, and uh, Derek Chauvin was on trial, and he lost several of his motions to change uh, venue. I mean, at the time, he was the most hated man in America. Everybody knew who he was, everybody saw that trial, and he lost the change of venue. In Idaho, it's governed by uh, criminal rule of procedure rule 21 that you can't get a fair and impartial jury. And I think the only shot the defense would have is if they started voir dire, they started to question potential jurors, and then they realized that nobody could be fair and impartial. That's highly unlikely, but that would be the only shot they have. So no, this case is not going to be moved. Joe, another great example. Thank you for that. Michael Riley, last but certainly not least, want you to weigh in. Your thoughts, please. Good morning, Joe. Thanks for having me. 
Yes, I tend to agree. I think it's very unlikely that a judge would grant the motion. Uh, the lawyers are going to have an opportunity to question the potential jurors and, uh, you know, explore this issue if they're overwhelmed by the pretrial publicity um, and really uh, go through the motions and make sure that they have a fair, impartial jury. Um, you know, the example I thought about, it's in the news, is the Michelle Traconis case up here in Connecticut where I am. Uh, lawyers in that case made a similar motion, tried to move the case, and that motion was denied. Another great example. Yeah, we're still in that one now, as you know, Michael. The defense set to present their last witness in this case uh, this morning. Uh, so we all agree uh, it is highly unlikely. And, and as you said, David, you know, a reminder, it, you can hear of the case. You know, you just have to be fair and impartial. So hearing it isn't automatic DQing, you know, for any of the people who happen to be in the pool. We'll leave the Koberger case there for now. Uh, the next day is going to be back in court, I believe, is next week. And so uh, we'll have more updates on that when the time comes. In the meantime, we want to switch gears and go to Georgia and talk about the rape trial for the alleged cult leader, Elio Bishop. This case is underway and the trial almost didn't go. I just want to make sure, Mr. Bishop, you understand the maximum is actually life without the possibility of parole. Do you understand that? It's not just life. That's why I want to make sure you understand it. I'm ready to go forward, happy to have this trial. That were hang-ups regarding whether it would be an Alfred plea, first offender, those kind of things. Um, that's the hang-up for purposes of right now, Judge. Okay. Um, but we're ready to go forward. All right. Well, we're going to go forward with the trial. I just want to make sure he understands that the maximum is not just life, but it's life without the possibility of parole. Okay, so here's what had happened. The state extended a plea offer that Bishop rejected. And that was the judge talking to him afterwards, making sure he understands what's going to be on the table if he proceeds to trial. So here's what the plea agreement looked like. It was going to be 30 years, serve 30 years. Uh, count one, which was the rape charge, would have been reduced to aggravated assault. Count two, the false imprisonment would have been dismissed entirely. Uh, and then there would have been some other guilty pleas uh, to a charge involving uh, the transmission of nude or sexually explicit electronic materials. So now Bishop, as the judge said, is looking at 25 to life without parole if he is convicted. So we want to ask our panel, was rejecting the deal the right decision? Let's bring them all back in now. Mike Riley, let me start with you this time. Uh, your thoughts, please. Thanks, Julie. Clearly, Mr. Bishop wants his day in court. He's willing to push his, all of his chips into the uh, middle of the table. He's essentially betting his life. He's been through several lawyers. He clearly knows that he wants to uh, test the state's evidence, and it seems like that's what he's going to do. If I'm defending him and I have a client that is dead set on a trial, your job as a defense lawyer is to give him his trial and give him the best shot he has. Uh, but yeah, very steep penalty that he is facing at this trial. Oh, it's definitely, Michael. Thank you. Joe Tamburino, to you next, please. Your thoughts. He should take the deal. There's no doubt about it. I think the evidence against him is quite strong. Uh, you know, the victim is going to hold up from everything we're reading. He was offered 30 years, and I thought there was some discussion. I heard the word Alford, as in Alford plea from the 1970 U.S. Supreme Court case where you could plead guilty even though you're maintaining your innocence because you're saying, well, they're going to be able to prove my guilt anyway. So to go from natural life, no parole, when they're offering you 30 years and you could get parole, that's hard to pass up for a case like that. Great point, Joe. Last but not least, David Bruno, would you take us home on this case, please? Yeah, sure. What we're watching right there is the pretrial conference, and the judge has to go through all the defendant's rights, their constitutional right to remain silent, cross-examine witnesses, right to a trial, and that's where it's all laid out, exposure. And what's surprising to me is the reaction from the defendant. The defendant seemed like he didn't even know what the exposure was. He looked at his attorney, his eyebrows went up as if he didn't <laughs> have the conversation before, which is amazing to me because at that stage, you need to know what you're up against, what the exposure is, what the consequences. That's the purpose of the hearing that he's sitting at. So I'm surprised about his reaction.
Right. David, thank you for pointing that out. You are spot on. I'm thinking they also didn't have a conversation about that paisley print jacket either. Huh? That might be a little distracting for the jury. We'll leave it there. But again, today is going to be day two for this guy. So we'll keep you posted on any updates. Big thanks to David Bruno and Michael Riley for being with us this morning. Have a great weekend, guys. Joe Tamarino is coming along with us for what's tipping the scales. And here's what's coming up next in our spotlight. We just moved in here. Gotcha. How long have you guys lived here? Okay. How long have you lived here? Like three weeks. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. That's why the neighbors don't know us. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, hi, neighbor, sorry. Well, we're taking a close look at the forensics in the Arizona case against cult mom. Plus, what tipped the scales in day one for the Rust movie armor? Lenny. Good morning, Keith Terry and Danae Sookie. I'm Captain Rosnallo, who's president of Marion Custody. Thank you, ma'am. Can you tell me your name and date of birth? Uh, Lori Valadeva, 626-1973. All right, this is the time set for a complex case scheduling conference. This morning, we're shining a spotlight on the charges that cult mom Lori Valudebel is facing in Arizona. She's accused of conspiracy to commit murder with her ex-husband, Charles Vallow. He is the victim in this one. She's also accused of the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreau, her niece Melanie's former husband. Now her trial date's currently set for August the 1st, and her brother Alex Cox is the one who shot and killed Charles Vallow. Now, Cox said it was done in self-defense after Vallo hit him with a baseball bat. Alex Cox is now deceased, too. And prosecutors only have some prior interviews from him detailing what Lori claims happened that day. Take a look. When you were going around and he was coming at you with the bat, mm -hmm. how was he holding the bat? Just like that. Like, backwards. One else and one else. Like he was swinging, but like... Swinging it backwards? He would have done like... Like he would have swung it backwards at me, not frontwards. Okay, yeah. He had, he was a base, professional baseball player. Okay. <laughs> so, it wasn't a good idea for Tyler to get out of the house. <laughs> Probably not the... I mean, he played semi-pro yeah. when he was young. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, and then I was kind of turned around. And we were all right there in that room, except for the kids had been outside by that time, and I heard... The gunshot. Mm, okay, so Lori was there, Ty Lee was there, and Alex Cox was there. Now, Ty Lee is deceased, as we know, as well. Uh, so, really, the only witness left is, is Lori, right? But we do have some videotaped interviews that were done with Alex Cox. I'm going to play them for our very special guest. We want to welcome him now. He is an expert in forensics. You know him, Dr. Kenny Kinsey. He's also the owner of Kenny Kinsey and Associates. Uh, wonderful to have you on the show. Dr. Kinsey, thanks for being with us. Good morning, Ms. Julie. Thank you for having me. Of course. I want to start by playing some clips from Alex Cox when police interviewed af him after this incident. And uh, here he's uh, detailing the fight with Charles. Let's watch. What happened? I mean, I grabbed it from behind it. Okay. And then we went to the ground. And then, um, and then we separated, and he hit me, and then that's when I left. Okay. So you grabbed him from behind yeah. him. How come you grabbed him from behind Because he was in front of me, and he was going after Tiny with the bat. Did you see him swing the bat at you? No. Okay. So you pulled him to the ground. You got back up. I got back up. He hit me in the back of the head. I don't know. It was with the bat or not. I assumed it was. Okay. Because he had it. Okay. Um, so he hit you with the back of the head. Yeah. So he, he's basically coming at you and he's yelling, you're watching his body language. Yeah. And you said you told him, and I, I, I didn't, when we're talking, yeah. I'm not I'm trying to not take notes and listen to what you're saying. I'm trying to calm the situation. Okay. I'm going to drop your bat and then he's f you and whatever. Okay. I'm have him. Um, did you, did you ever tell him to leave or did you say drop the bat or? First I just said drop the bat. Okay. And then did you say anything else after that? I didn't have time. You fire a couple times. Yep. And then you go to the kitchen. Correct. And then back to the bedroom. Yes. Okay. When you went back to the bedroom, you washed your hands. No, I washed my hands. Sorry, you washed your hands in the kitchen. Yeah. You 
put your gun back in your room. Yep. Where'd you set it at? Uh, just on the floor. Okay, so you set it on the floor. Um, get your phone. Yep. Call 911. Yep. All right, Dr. Kinsey, if you were there in that house analyzing that crime scene, tell us where you would go, what you would do, exactly what you'd be looking for, please. You know, Ms. Julie, being a, a moot point, uh, you, your advocacy for victims, so I understand uh, them going through with the trial process, but I think Lori is just basking in the notoriety, but you got to look at the alleged assault with the bat, and you've got to work the parameters of that. Was it possible? Did it happen the way uh, Lori's brother claimed it happened? And one way or the other, these videos are going to come in because he got off real lucky, in my opinion. But this is, you know, about Lori's deceased husband and certainly about her former nephew. So I, I would look at the parameters of the alleged assault and probably not much documentation, but whatever documentation was there. And then you've got also the 88,000 pages of discovery. So hopefully there's something in there that's going to pertain to at least what would lead to this conspiracy. And I also understand that there were 90, up to 90 phone calls and text messages between Lori and possibly her brother. So hopefully, you know, this won't be, I don't believe this is going to be a forensic case. I don't believe it's going to be a drop of blood or you know, an impression. I really believe this is, as we see so much lately, this is going to be about electronic communication and timelines. And uh, like I said, it's pretty much a moot point, but you're, you're getting a pound of flesh for that victim. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Uh, Dr. Kinsey, thank you for that. When, when you said it's not going to be about a drop of blood, I couldn't help but think there was literally like a drop of blood on the back of Alex Cox's head. Look at this. Now, if he were hit in the head, with a baseball bat swung by a former semi-pro baseball player, wouldn't we think there's a chance he may not live to tell about it? Well, you know, Ms. Julie, not adding any credence or, or dependability to his statements, but you got to look at it independently. And that's what I said. You know, you'd have to look at the layout, look if the swing was possible. You would think that someone with that ability swinging a bat, certainly he probably wouldn't be with us, but there may be limitations, environmental limitations that, you know, prevented a, a good lick or a good swing. And I believe all that's probably gonna come into count, but it's definitely not the kind of injury you would expect, uh, especially to the back of your head, if the person is uh, proficient swinging that implement. Right. Dr. Kinsey, you got me thinking about what that house might have looked like. We know they just moved into it. Uh, to your point about whether there were limitations, you wonder, would there be any broken furniture or something else that got in the way of the swing? Huh? Those would be things you might be looking for if you assess it. Uh, how about some of the videos we have of Charles Vallow? This is really eerie, Dr. Kinsey. We have him calling police months prior to when he was killed, essentially warning them and saying my wife is dangerous she's gone off the deep end i'm afraid she's going to harm the children which we know she did jj and ty lee and here in this clip he even says that he thinks she could murder him as well she's lost her mind uh, i don't know how else to say it we're lds she thinks she's a resurrected being and a and a a god. You're not Charles. I don't know who you are, what you did with Charles, but I can murder you now with my powers. Mm. Dr. Kinsey, what do you think of that? Wow, Miss Julie. Uh, she she definitely is, is has some issues, but I believe her and, and the storm, as he's called, you know, so affectionately, I believe they complimented one another in Dirty Deeds, and I believe, once again, religion, uh, cultism is, is put on the forefront and, you know, used as an excuse. But that, that's not what any religion that I'm familiar with would, uh, would promote. Mm -hmm. Isn't that the truth? No, it was so disgusting. I, I know um, you were watching along with us as we watched her trial uh, taking place.
uh, in Idaho, and it, it's it's just it's so uh, despicable. These beautiful kids who were, who were loved, and and other family members who gladly would have taken them. It was it was all very selfish, and and this is really kind of a continuation of that story, isn't it? Even though it happened in a different state. It is really part of what occurred in Idaho. So do you think that these prosecutors, Dr. Kinsey, are going to be sitting down with their law enforcement experts like yourself and, and going back through some of that Idaho case evidence as well? Most certainly, Ms. Julie. And, and, you know, the psychological part and the profiling part will be so important here. As I mentioned, timelines, you know, uh, you've seen dozens and dozens of cases that were proven just with timelines and the electronic communication. Uh, I've always said, you know, that if I was on the dark side, I would definitely leave my phone home and I'd drive a 1970 Plymouth uh, <laughs> to and from the scene because that's gonna be the major evidence here. Unfortunately, you can't see into the future. So law enforcement at that point in time, you know, they took the complaint. They probably looked at it, you know, discounted it because it does sound a little insane, but is prophetic that you know we've gotten this far now and and with JJ and Tally and and Tammy you know who, who would have really thought that when law enforcement took this original complaint that we'd be this far years later isn't that the truth always brilliant analysis from you Dr. Kenny Kinsey thank you so much for making time for us this morning would love to all oh, right back at you and to your beautiful family give them my love please take good care and we're going to squeeze in a quick break. Here's what we have coming up next for you on Opening Statements. Oh, my God. Just relax. Okay? I'm just trying to... There's a whole lot of people here, so I'm trying to secure everybody. Will the rust body cam evidence tip the scales of justice? That's next. A famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and hop the gun, the gun goes off. Now, Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage today, only on Court TV. Now for what's tipping the scales. Testimony set to resume this morning in the manslaughter case for Rust movie armorer Hannah Gutierrez. On day one, one of the most revealing pieces of evidence was the defendant's immediate reaction to the fatal shooting of Helena Hutchins. Here's a clip from police body cam. How do I know this is a gun? That's the gun. We need more units out here. Uh -huh. I haven't been inside. I don't know. Okay, what I'm going to have you do is sit in here. Okay? Arrested. You're not arrested. The door's going to stay open. Uh, since you're the armor, they're going to want to talk to you more than anybody, okay? Oh, my God. Just relax. Okay? I'm just trying to... There's a whole lot of people here, so I'm trying to secure everybody. Do you want me to sit with you? You can stay right here with us. Stay right here with you. What do you think of her reaction, and will it tip the scales of justice? Let's bring in our guest, criminal defense attorney and former prosecutor Joe Tamburino. Joe, what do you think about this? I don't think it's going to tip in her favor, and here's why. Um, when you have that kind of a reaction, you would expect someone like her to say, how could this be? There, there's no live ammo in the gun. There's no live ammo on the set. This is impossible to happen. She didn't say that. Now, she was very distraught, obviously, and she was very concerned about them. She was like, are they okay? But the real reaction from an armorer should have been, this is impossible. There's no live ammo on this set. She never says that. Isn't that the truth, Joe? You're right. That omission you just pointed out, uh, that's key. That's a really great point. What she didn't say can mean as that's much right. as what she did. I love it. Uh, let's take a look at some of what the prosecutor said in the opening statement now. 
the actor, Alec Baldwin, pointed a gun on that set, and he either had his finger on the trigger and the hammer cocked, or he pulled the trigger as he was pointing that at Ms. Hutchins and Mr. Souza, who was right behind her. And make no mistake, this is not a prop gun. This is a real gun. Mr. Baldwin pointed it right at him, either had his finger on the trigger and depressed or pulled it, causing that gun to fire and hit Ms. Hutchins. I do want to leave you with one final statement, and this is a statement that Ms. Gutierrez made uh, when she was being interviewed on the day of the shooting. She says at the end, I just, I don't know. I wish I would have checked it more. And so do we. Mm, power stuff, powerful stuff right there from the prosecutor. I wish I would have checked it more. In the clip before that was obviously defense counsel. They're blaming Alec Baldwin, Joe. So uh, first to the prosecutor's point about her not taking the safety steps. I'm curious, as you were watching this yesterday, were you astounded when we learned, according to the state of New Mexico, that this woman didn't know how to recognize the difference between live rounds and dummy rounds and that they actually found six live rounds on that set. I was shocked, completely shocked. This was such an unsafe set. And that's gonna be the problem with Alec Baldwin's case because he's one of the producers. He's not only a star and a writer and acting in it, he's one of the producers and the producer has the ultimate authority. I mean, they hire all these people. They hire the directors, they hire the writers. So he's got to ensure that this is a safe scene. That's gonna be his biggest problem. But the prosecutor did an excellent job by saying, look, she even says she didn't use proper care and that's the heart of this case. When you're in a negligence type of situation, that's the prosecutor saying, you were negligent. You didn't use the right care. You didn't, you didn't use every precaution that you should have that would have been reasonable here. So I think that was very powerful. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Joe. Curious what you think about the defense strategy here in trying to really lay it on thick that she wasn't the problem. The ultimate problem was Baldwin and the way he pointed the weapon at a human being. That's the only defense that they have. I mean, really, that's it. Because when you're in a situation where you're being accused of not using proper care, basically, you know, being completely negligent, you're going to have to say, wait a minute, there was an intervening act. Somebody else was more negligent than, than I was, and therefore, they're the real cause of death. It's the only thing they've got as a defense. If I were defending her, I would be using the same argument, too. Mm -hmm. Right, Joe. Joe, tell me, you, know, you made this point earlier about Alec Baldwin being a producer as well. Do you think in terms of, you know, his defense that that's all, it, it, it's going to be factored in, right? That, that he was part of the hiring. He was not only one of the people in the event, in the fatal event, who uh, pulled back that hammer and released it, according to officials, but also that, like you said, he vetted the people on the set. He was the guy uh, where kind of the buck stops with him in terms of the set safety and, and the production. Uh, how do you think that's going to go? Well, Mr. Baldwin has a much better case than Ms. Gutierrez. There's no doubt about that because he could easily come in and say, I did better. I looked at her CV, curriculum vitae, her resume. Uh, you know, her father's well known in the industry. And so I assumed what she was telling me was correct, that she could be a proper and safe armorer. So that's gonna be a pretty good defense because he's gonna say, everybody does this in, in Hollywood like I did it. I look at the materials, I take them at face value, I trusted her. I had no idea that she was going to be so negligent and allow a half dozen live rounds on my set. That's never happened to me before, and I've made who knows how many films. So I think Mr. Baldwin's got a pretty good defense. Um, and, and, you know, being the producer, yes, the buck stops with him, but there's a difference between criminal liability and civil liability. In the civil case, they've got a great case, I think, against Mr. Baldwin. In the criminal case, he's got defenses. Joe Tamborino, excellent points from you as always, my friend. Thank you so much for your time and expertise this morning. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. And my friends, that is all for opening statements. But guess what? You can watch or share this episode if you like. We've got it up for you on CourtTV.com. Just click on the Shows tab. We put them all up every day.